Hey guys, Jared Duckett, Duckett Ladd Dental CPAs and Advisors here again with my business partner, Bill Ladd, and Dr. Michael Abernathy. Guys, appreciate you joining in again. Hey, you, want to jump in and um, kind of go back, you know, kind of go through this timeline, if you will, of, of the very first, you know, we talked about the self-diagnosis aspect of, you know, now that your business is probably, the door's closed or your production's way down, really set down self-diagnose yourself, be honest, and give yourself a grade of where you're at. And then we talked a little bit about the mindset shift and, and you need to have a shift in mindset and think about how the business of dentistry is changing, put on the whatever it takes t-shirt and, and uh, think about what your business is gonna look like after this. And, and really, then we dove into the overhead component. Might've, might've got you guys uh, head hurting a little bit with all those numbers, but diving into the, the, the right overhead structure for that ideal uh, dental practice and what that looks like. Right. And if you guys remember and, and, and go back and look at that episode, if you haven't viewed it yet, but that ideal overhead structure for that ideal dental practice, if you think about the big number there, that, that 25% number, and that's, that's basically compensation. So that's the compensation for your team. And we want to kind of hit on that today, that specific topic and kind of twofold. So one is, and this is probably a lot of you guys are having this question right now is, is how do I bring my team back? But then we want to hit on that. But then also, what do I compensate them at? And, and I, want, I want to preface this, but don't think about how you've always done things. Remember, we'd self-diagnose ourselves, mindset shift, so things are going to be different. But think about the compensation of what truly you need to, to compensate your staff at to get the best out of them. So guys, I want to throw it to you and just, just dive right in with both feet is, Dr. Abernathy, talk about what, what should dentists be thinking about right now proactively on how they start bringing their team members back when they start opening? Kind of walk us through that process uh, of what that looks like. Okay. Let, let me, let me uh, <laughs> I, I feel like we need to have a disclaimer uh, so I don't ruin your business today. Uh, I, you know, these are the opinions, you know, they always have a deal that said, the opinions of the speaker may not be what we think, you know. Uh, and that can happen because, again, the only time I open my mouth is to change feet. But it's also based on thousands of practices and, and lots of challenges in, in a dental practice. So, you know, we talked about a mindset of kind of, a, kind of a startup practice. I want you to change that just a moment since you have kind of diagnosed yourself. Let's assume that this startup mentality is – you just bought a used practice, right? Okay, I, I, you bought a practice somebody else owned and they're selling and leaving, okay? Now this takes it a little deeper in mindset in that, okay, it's your practice. And you're looking at it as if you're a new owner buying it and some of the things you look at, you're gonna look at the numbers that we self-diagnosed. Okay, we're gonna look at all that. You would look at that, okay. But then you're also going to be looking at staff and the upsides on this practice. Okay, what were they doing good? What weren't they not doing good? And then how could we fix that? But as you look at staff, I've never seen a practice when I, that I bought with staff because it's important that I maintain certain staff, right? If I'm, if I'm buying this practice, I mean, certain are like really key. It might be that hygienist, or it might be that front desk, or it might be that star assistant. It's different in every practice, but I'm going to know that. I need to know it. You know, that's part of my mindset. So I'm going to, I need you to look at your practices if you're buying it, and you look at this staff that way. Like, who's a real plus, and who's maybe kind of marginal, okay? And I'm going to ask the other doctor. Now, you've asked the other doctor kind of by self-diagnosing yourself, and it is your practice. It's really hard to be critical about something you already own. So if I could just look into my eyes and you're now buying this practice, I need you to look at it a little differently. Now, when I look at a practice, I'm looking at, at, at staff. Okay, who do I need to keep? Who's not that important? Then I'm gonna look at what they're paid. I mean, it never fails. There's always one staff person that is making 40% more than anybody I've ever seen that, that does nothing but sterilization. or so, I mean, just something weird. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, there is there another like, you know, like a reality show going on here, and that's why she's getting paid so much, or he's getting paid so much. I mean, you're just going. I'm going to ask the doctor. I said, what were you that doctor Phil moment? What were you thinking? 
Okay. Why is this person making so much? And, and it usually comes down to this. Oh, well, we dated and no, I'm just teasing. Yeah, we dated and now we broke up. Okay. No, but I mean, it, still go, it, it usually comes down to this, that it's, it's like, she's always been with me. And every year I just kind of gave her a little bump on her salary. Mm -hmm. So, and, and, and then there's, you know, there were times where, well, inflation's not that big a deal now, but you know, I kind of did a cost of living adjustment and, and then I just feel like I can't work without her. So I slip her a little money. So tell me about her. And he says, well, you know, she doesn't really come in at eight when we open, you know, it's not convenient for her to come until about nine, you know, and then she needs to leave about three 30 and I'm going, okay, this isn't good. Okay. And, and so I need you to look at that and I want to kind of start all over because in, in essence, what we've done is we fired everybody that works for us right now. Okay. They're either you know, furloughed or, you know, they're not working or you may have an assistant that comes in a few hours every day or an office manager that checks something that probably she doesn't need to check right now. I mean, just, it's just very, very tenuous, uh, but they're not working. So in a way, we've got a potentially good asset if we handle it right. And I think part of handling it is going to be how we bring the staff back, how we pay them. And I'm going to assume, or I would assume if I'm buying a practice that no one can really count on being hired back. And so I want you to look at this, that you have this one opportunity to do this. Okay, so staff, I, I think there's only a couple of ways that we're going to be able to bring them back. And then we're going to talk about how they get paid. And then maybe if we had a follow-up deal that we could talk maybe about a bonus system or commission-based pay, stuff like that. But let's just stay with the basics this time. Okay, so I'm thinking what's going to happen is someone's going to decide. Uh, right now it's being tossed up between the uh, the king, I mean the president, uh, thinking that they have ultimate, you know, say over where the states open up, and the Constitution stating that the governors do. Okay, so that's going to vary. We have four or five governors that have never sheltered in place yet. The states haven't done it. Louisiana is one of those states, and again, I saw him interviewed. I, you know, it's like, okay, that kind of makes sense too. Uh, so. In all likelihood, it's going to happen differently in every state. It's not going to be a light switch that on June 1st or April 15th, they just switch the light on again and we can go back to work. Okay, so it's going to happen differently. And, and my suspicion is that if, if New York has peaked and it starts back downhill and it finally gets, it still would be three or four weeks after the peak that you come back. But if, if at that time, Kansas City just is destroyed, or, or Dallas, or, or you know some of the Middle America cities that you know you don't aren't you know, Oklahoma City that aren't huge, but they just have. It'll be in the news, and everybody will be reluctant to turn the light switch. Okay, so when it comes back, we have no patients on our schedule, we have no staff, and probably. We could do this one of a couple, three ways. Okay, one, on that day, on that Monday morning, when you start back, you hire everybody back and you pay them the same that you've been paying them. Probably okay. most people are thinking that, right? Okay, so as a CPA, and I'm not talking about your clients, I'm talking about some practice in Ireland. Would you suggest that they do that? Bring them all back? And I mean, to me, now this is cruel. Now, let, let's let's say since doctors are going to be watching, maybe staff are watching it too. Okay. The average stay for staff in my practice was fourteen point seven years. I would want to take care of all my staff. Okay, but the reality of this is that we haven't worked for a couple of months. We've deplenished any money that we had left to to do that, and we have to be realistic. And and we had already talked in one of these about making difficult decisions. This is that time that leadership is going to be real important. So you could talk to the staff on a conference line, you know, whatever you want to do, stand out in the parking lot and yell at each other back and forth what you're thinking about doing. But you could invite them all back at their current pay. I think from a financial standpoint, I mean, just numbers and sense, common sense, that doesn't make sense. 
if the demand doesn't come back at the same time we bring all the staff back. Right. Now, as we're sitting here, if you could project yourself out, <clears throat> you know, at what point do you think people were, would come back? I mean, they're thinking about canceling, not canceling, moving the entire football, professional football season to January of 2021. Hmm. They're, thought, they're talking about not having a Democratic or Republican national convention for a presidential election. I'm thinking we should probably just not have a president for the next four years, but you know, we're talk about that. Okay. We'd probably be just fine at that. So I'm thinking what's going to happen is we're going to be there on a day one. Uh, we shouldn't hire everybody back on that day for their current pay. Okay. Two, we could bring them back as we need them. So they stay unemployed and we bring them back when they're needed. Okay. I think that's probably more of a wise decision but it needs to be something that's discussed with your staff because in a way it's like looking at that practice you just bought and deciding that the most important people to get back in my practice might be one assistant and one front desk. Someone to answer the phone, someone to assist me if someone actually showed up for work. Now, let's say one, you had one patient that needed their teeth cleaned that day I remember when I first started out, pretty much it was whatever it took, right? Someone came in, they wanted a teeth clean. I went, okay, have a seat. I'll clean your teeth. Okay. You may have to do that. Yeah. As distasteful as that might sound to some doctors and as arrogant as some people might be that, no, that won't be the case. If you're prepared that it might be the case and it's not, it's, there's no foul, right? It, everything's going to work out okay. But if it does, you need to be prepared to make those decisions. So I'm thinking day one, I'm going to need an assistant and at least for part of the day, a front desk. Okay. And then on day two, we make a decision. If no, if it's still, I just, I'm fine. I'm going to keep going, but it's all going to be predicated by this. When we went over benchmarks and you were talking about your, your head swirling, this is the, you know, if we had a set of glasses, you know, that that could filter out I, they on tv they have these blue blockers their sunglasses and they'll show you so without blue blockers and with blue blockers and you can see so so well you know it takes all the glare away this is the one formula that'll take all the glare away when it comes to overhead is don't hire a staff person until they're producing at least twenty thousand dollars per staff person Okay. That's that key metric. Yeah. yeah. It's that key metric. So if we took a P and L and we looked and we, we saw that compensation, the amount of money that we were, we were setting aside to pay staff was 35% instead of 25 to 28. Okay. The problem is we're either overstaffed or underproducing with the number of staff we have. Okay. You have an opportunity not to be overstaffed for your production level. Okay, now we're not counting the doctor, but I mean, let's make it simple. If you just graduated from dental school and we didn't have any medical legal problems with you working by yourself, you just went into the office and don't you think if you worked five days a week, you could do $20,000 a month without a staff person? Of course you could. So doesn't it make sense that if you had one assistant and you weren't busy at all, I mean, just like she could answer the phone and help you you could still make 20,000. Well, it sound, that sounds possible. But the minute I say, well, doesn't it make sense that you should, could do 40,000 if you had a front desk and an assistant? Now it starts to get uncomfortable. Everybody's going, well, you know, it's like, I don't know that I could do that. Because you've got offices out there that, that, uh, that you know, that CPAs have that only do 50,000 a month. And they've got four or five employees which their overhead is really bad. The profit's not very good. Yeah. So this is a do over to do that. So I think you need to slip on those glasses and, and try as close as you can. I'm fine if it's 18,000 per employee, but pretty close now. Okay. So week two, you start noticing that we're getting people scheduled for recall and hygiene. Well, there are days that patients like to come in. Now, keep in mind, a lot of these patients haven't been working, right? They, they haven't had the opportunity to make a living either. And so if they were to come in for cleaning, 
maybe Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, eight to five isn't going to be a good time for them. I mean, they just got back to work. I'm going to take off an hour in the middle of the day to go see the dentist. Yeah. Okay. That's a great point. Part of your tough decisions might be, I need to look at consumer hours because this is a, this is a given. If you're open peak demand times like seven to nine and three to five or six and Saturdays, it's pretty easy to fill those hours. I mean, go back in, in 2019 and look at your schedule and you'll notice that you're really booked till about 10 o'clock in the morning and from about three on in the afternoon every day. Now, as we come back and we're trying to make it as easy as we can for people to get back in the fold, yeah. you might have to look at, at least in the short haul, at your, at your hours and, and make these times available. But okay, so it's week two you start noticing that, hey, we're getting maybe seven or eight people a week that want to come in, then I would probably pick all day Friday, you know, or have the hygienist come in just part-time, like from three to five, a couple of days a week, and, and see those people. But whatever the patient wants, okay? I mean, we've got to, you know, you can't get better at giving people what they don't want. If they call in, they're already a little nervous about, they want to say yes to you because they respect you, but They've also got the tug of their own job and the other responsibilities that they have. And, and keep in mind, their kids are not in school. Uh, I mean, you know, it's, it's just you've got to be willing to do whatever it takes. So this is a conversation we have to have with our staff before we hire them back. You know, Ms. Assistant, our hours are going to have to be, have to adapt to what the consumer wants, okay? There may be a staff person that doesn't want to do that now. I mean, Okay, you're looking for another staff person for that. You know, they won't do it. I mean, they've got to be all in on this. But, you, you know, again, the number one job of a leader is to define what's reality and core in, in your practice. And these and are the, explaining and explaining why, you know, explaining explain the why. why behind it. Yeah. And making sure, I mean, it's not enough just to say it. You have to be sure that they heard what you thought you said. There's a difference between saying it and, and then making sure they heard what you thought you said. Okay. And, and I mean, you look at the, I mean, I, I don't want to get religious with people, but I mean, I, you know, just got through with Easter. I mean, I, you know, everybody he have heard of Jesus and Proverbs and I mean, the, the, the stories that he tells. And I mean, and a lot of times the new Testament, he goes, Okay, let me tell you this story about the lady that blah, 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 and the, you know, and then I'm sitting there, the son of God, and he's looking at these people going, okay, let me tell you another story, okay, so you finally get it, because people just don't get it yeah. the way you say it sometimes, and so you know your staffs well, some need a, a picture drawn for them, some of them need to see a graph, some of them, you know, all you need to do is tell them, yeah. you know, so Again, so Dr. Abernathy, let me let me ask you a question. I'm going to play devil's advocate here a little bit. Sure. I might be getting myself in trouble here, but <laughs> what would you say to the to the doctor out there who who's saying, and we don't know when they're going to open back up, but let's say in their mind they have this June first date. Let's just say, yep. 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 and they're saying right now, okay, June first. I'm looking at the schedule, and yep. I'm I'm full. You know, I've got a full schedule. Right. Yep. Um, so I'm going to need all those people. I mean, my schedule's full. I need those same people I had before. Right. How, how would you address that? You know, I mean, yeah, now no, granted, that's good, not all that, those no. people are going to come in, but the schedule's full. I need my people. Why would I not bring them all back? Yeah, I was talking to a doctor yesterday. And, and, and most of these doctors I talked to, I've never met, okay? So I create a face for them and a body so that I, you know, as I'm talking, I see them as a, a person. And he was going, well, I'm in the top 1% of all practices and blah, blah. So he sent me some numbers. Okay, we're talking. So, oh, yeah, my practice is going to be, I, I give it, you know, 14 days or so. I'll be right back up the way I was. Okay, now, and, and so I would tell him a story, a, pro, a little story, you know. And, and then he goes, yeah, that's not me. You know, it's, it's, it's called optimized bias. Okay, and you can look that up. I won't explain it to you, but. Uh, again, it's kind of like you don't think you will be the one. I mean, the people that walked across the stage, nobody thought they were just going to be an average practice, right? N no one thought that they'd go through a divorce and, and or a drug addiction or 
you know, have your brother die before, I, you know, no, you know, everybody has that perception that they're not the one, okay? And yet it still happens. I, I you know, when we were talking about playing the game, okay? I play the game as if it's going to be more difficult to play, you know, than most people would think, okay? It's never hurt me if I think that way. Now, I would probably start if, if this guy has a schedule, and, and this guy said that. Oh, I've got a schedule. I'm booked out six months in hygiene, which I'm going. Yeah, you know, that sucks. I mean, you know, that's the worst thing that could possibly happen. Okay. But, but anyway, I said, okay, great. I said, my suggestion is that at least a week before you confirm those appointments, mm. like yeah. chisel and stone, and, and not like, you know, I would have the hygienist confirm their own appointments a week ahead, right at first. Even though a front desk used to do it, at least there's some rapport with that patient, okay? If I had a, a patient, I think you ought to call them. If it's a big case and you got three hours set to do a big case, I'm pretty much going to call and say, Mrs. Jones, hi, this is Dr. Everly. I realize that everything's just been topsy-turvy and everybody's kind of worried about stuff. We've done all these things and blah, blah, blah. I'm calling just to confirm that you will be here. We've reserved three hours for you. We won't be able to fill that with anyone else. So it's reserved for you. I didn't know, know beyond a shadow of a doubt. I mean, if you're going to die on that day, I need at least a week's notice. <laughs> yourself, Okay. That kind of thing. Yeah. I want to know, is it a real schedule? Or is it, am I just a, you know, a figment of my imagination? Okay. So, so let me that's throw an, an example out there for you, Dr. Abernathy. Let's, let's say that you've got a doctor and we've had a conversation in the past that some doctors are non-assertive, right? So they, they're looking at their team beforehand. Let's say they were a 40% component, but they loved each other and they were a family and, and, you know, some of them were really good. Some of them were okay, but they all kind of had each other's back. And they're looking at this team and they say, how do I even begin to not bring back somebody who is, is like family to me? What, what would you say to that doctor? And I, I'd say that's a, probably a pretty common scenario out there. It is. And I had one doctor that said, okay, I've gotten that loan. I mean, you know, I haven't gotten money from it, but it covers me for two months. Okay. Okay. I mean, I'm not talking about those people. I mean, you, right. you have a plan in place that you can run with it. But what I'm afraid of with the non-assertive doctor or the overly assertive doctor that's got a great self-image for no apparent reason, the guy that said, I've got it, it's all booked out, it's going to be great. Okay, whatever. It, it doesn't matter. I just, I just need you to, because we're looking at this practice as if you just bought it. I mean, yeah. are there some improvements that can be made? Now, let me ask you this. Let's say we do bring them back completely and we pay them. And at the end of the first month, you don't have enough money to pay them. Okay, now, I would be fine in not taking a check for a month. Okay, yeah. But can you do that and survive it? Okay, okay. let's say you can. I said, then great. You do what you want to do. I mean, I'm the guy that um, I had a, an employee that our insurance didn't cover a real expensive surgery on a baby that she just had. And I wrote a check for over $100,000. Okay, because I saved my money. I had another that had never owned a new car and two weeks after stopped at a four-way that was not a four-way, it was a two-way and T-boned it and I paid the difference in what the car, okay, I mean, you know, I was there to help them. I mean, I'm, I'm like that and I would want to bring them back. But part of this, and I'm going to give you a third way to bring them back, okay? Part of this is one, we've got to have those difficult conversations and the non-assertive doctor and if it's family, there's some point, I mean, you can see this, there's going to be some point in the future, if I'm wrong, that you will have this conversation with your staff. If it doesn't come back, let's say it only comes back and it's 50% of what it was, and you're paying them full time, then in effect, if you were spending 30% on staff, and you only have 50% of the patients come back, then you are now paying 60% of what yeah. you were paying before. Right. It's untenable. Okay. I, I, there's not going to be an easy way to approach this, but I feel like staff that are family understand that there are going to be hard times and that we're in this together. And if I told them, I said, look, I will not take one penny 
of this for the first four months, uh, four weeks. You know, I, I'll pay you. But if we can't get this up to a certain level, we've got to talk about it. And yeah. here are our options. I pay. I mean, it's real simple. Yeah, I, I go, I fire somebody so there's less of us. Or everybody takes a pay cut. Right. We still, you know, I mean, there's only so many options here. And I'm not a hard ass when it comes to this. I've just found, because I'm so non-assertive, it is easier for me to attack something early in the problem before yeah. it becomes a huge thing. To and, and so I advise those, your example, Bill, was, you know, is that I, I would still have this discussion with them, even if I was planning on bringing them back at full pay. Now, so we've talked about bringing them back at full pay. We've talked about bringing them back as we need them. Okay. There is a hybrid. Okay. We could bring all of them back. And, and again, I, I, I see this as an opportunity to change your culture. We could bring them all back. And let's say we were, when we diagnosed ourselves, we were paying 33% for staff, which is not good. And that, that's another discussion, how we could fix that after everything gets back. But it's 33%. Then you could have a discussion with everybody and said, look, I won't take a check. And I will pay you 32% of anything that we collect. Mm. But I'm thinking that our collections will be down that it's not going to be a light switch turned back on and we've got everything back the way it was. And so, you know, you could do it that way. So, it, you know, for every dollar you collect, you give them 32 cents and drop it in the table and they can divide it any way they want to. Mm. Okay. I mean, you could do that. I mean, there's a hybrid. Yes. Now what that might do is do you think a staff that agreed to do that, knowing that they're going to look at unemployment compared to working and making a wage or not making a wage. You could even do it where it was deferred. Let's say we could try it this way for four weeks. I'll keep an account in a, a piece of paper. And if we can get this practice back up in four weeks, I mean, it really gives that ownership mentality a real boost in the butt when they go, I've got some bacon in the fire. Do you think they'd be willing to work Saturday mornings? Do you think they would work late some evenings and come in and short notice and, and uh, make the calls that need to be made to patients and make sure they show up and, and go pick them up if, if they don't find a babysitter and, and you know, whatever. Yeah, they would. So what uh, you're saying there is, is, is maybe not just the doctor puts on the whatever it takes t-shirt. You have to hand those out to your staff too. You do. You know. and, and again, I, th I think most doctors are uh, absentee leaders a little bit they kind of go with the flow and if it's not if it's going going kind of okay it's they kind of don't rock the boat much i think this is the season and there's a season for everything that you have to step up and be a leader the nice thing about leadership it, it is there are no natural born leaders you're not born with this it's learnable okay mm -hmm. i mean you've got a little time off read a book on leadership read, you know there's so many out there, but I mean, just, you know, you've, you've got to partner with your staff to make, make this come back to the way it was. Yeah. And without that, so those are, those are really, so you got three options there on how to bring them back um, all, all across the board a little bit. How do you, and you kind of hit on this, but how do you address the compensation piece? You know, cause you can bring them all back and pay them exactly what they are making before. That's one option. But how, how do you dive a little deeper and, and get to what, what they are compensated once they come back? Well, you probably don't want to hear this because, I, you know, in, in diagnosing yourself and things that you should have already done, I, I probably would have had you review your policy manuals and go over your job descriptions. Okay. I think for a non-assertive doctor, it's a perfect time to just kind of shore that up. I just need one black, in a time of uncertainty, I need one black or white thing here. Your policy manual is your, is the, on that game plan, you know, playing the game. It is the rules, okay? And then the job description makes it real easy for a non-assertive doctor to address, maybe somebody always came in late a little bit, but you're going to hire them back because they're family, like Bill said. Uh, then 
you know, you can address that back and forth on the mail. Do you get it? And then you put them on the phone and you go, Hey, Julie, I, you know, I think we've got the job. You've added things. I've added things. We've kind of, you know, and I'll be glad to send you guys starter pieces for job descriptions, you know, for a one person front desk, a 1.52, three person front desk, assistants, uh, hygienist, office manager, as an example, so that you can give those to your folks. But it needs to be more, you know, okay, so we've got that. And so I'm going to tell Susie or ask Susie, I said, Susie, we've kind of come up this. And I said, now, if, if I find that you're not doing something or choose, you know, you're, you forget to do something or you choose not to do it, now that we've agreed that this is your job is, what do you think I should do? And then you'd be real quiet because the answer needs to be, there needs to be consequences if your staff doesn't pitch in. And, and this is the perfect time to do it. I think everybody, as you're bringing staff in, there may be one in a, in, a, in a practice of five employees that has always been marginal and it's just time not just to cut them loose, okay? You, you should call it right then. I mean, I have cows on my property and you handle cows in, in you know, separating pens and, and squeeze shoots and stuff. And I've had mama cows that, you know, didn't even have a calf, but they just go crazy and they'll go after you. I mean, it run right at you and hit a steel fence. I mean, I put her in a squeeze chute, put her in a trailer, and I, she goes to sale barn. If you leave her in that herd, the whole herd will be crazy, okay? And again, we cannot tolerate mediocre people. As your staff become more owners in this process, partnering with you, they won't tolerate these people either, but it says something if you choose not to bring somebody back. Now, I'm sorry I got off of that what you asked me, Jared, but I, I, I think, I just want to make sure that we're looking at this right so that when I answer that, you know, answer a question for you, it makes sense without having to add more to it. So a answer, ask your question again. Yeah, uh, I think, think well, like the, the tuning that, that, yeah. Yeah, the question was, so how do you, you know, so you're bringing them back. The question yeah. is, how do you, how do you compensate them, you know, once you're bringing them back? I think you, you went, and you, you said it perfectly, it's more of, well, before you figure out, do you compensate them or what do you compensate them? Right. You should think, should they be compensated? You know, are, are they, are they the one that I need to bring back? So I guess if, if, if they need to be brought back, how do you look at their compensation structure? Uh, so you got, you got a couple different levels, maybe you've got associates or hygienists. Um, yeah. Yeah. You, you know, so dental assistants, et cetera. Maybe you've got the office manager. How do you, how do you kind of look at the, the compensation structure Again, with the mentality, not how we've always done it. Again, this is a, a chance to reset. Yeah. How yeah. do you look at the compensation to make sure that it matches the production and what is the best for the business? Okay, well, I, I would probably say that there is, you know, we talked about bringing somebody back at full pay. Mm -hmm. okay. It could be bring them back for full pay for part-time. I mean, that's another hybrid of that is that, I mean, I'm hoping this isn't the case, but. I'm thinking the first week you're there, you may only need to be there three days, maybe Monday, Wednesday, Saturday. I, I don't know. I, you know, but then, then they, they were paid full pay, but they weren't given as many hours. Okay. Now I mean, I had one doctor that wanted to bring them all back at full pay, but uh, it was in a state where they have, don't have a lockdown. They can do more than emergencies, but no one's coming to the dentist. I said, well, you could do this. You could do part time. But you could do like, okay, this week, I'm going to have this assistant help me these two days, and then another assistant help me on this one day and another day next week. And so he got everybody in for part-time and paid them full salary, but it what just wasn't busy enough for them to have full-time to do that. And, and there is a difference here. I, and I don't know if we have time enough to talk about this, but let me, let me just kind of preface how I would go about looking at pay structures. Uh, I mean, one, it's got to be a competitive salary. You know, how do you find out if it's competitive? You can go to dentalworkers.com or indeed.com and look at actual an assistant salary in the area or an office manager or hygienist or whatever it is, just to see if you're in the ballpark. You could probably uh, go to a temp agency, subtract about 10 or 15% from it, and, and that would be about what it would be. And then we're looking at it from the, from the financial side. They should be, to be able to produce 
you know, 17,000 to 20,000 easy per employee. Okay. But let's get down into details here. I think that from this point forward, there should never ever be a cost of living raise. <laughs> okay. Now I'm going to replace it with something and we'll talk about it later. Yeah. I don't think there should ever be a longevity based raise. Now, there is another type of raise where you compensate people based on their competence, right? I'm going to write this down as never thought about it this way, just with competence raise, um, where you, you bring in somebody that's just got out of high uh, assistant school and she's kind of been the, you know, the second tier. She's a private in the, in the army here. And, and then she really gets to be pretty good. And you say, well, I need to raise her base salary. That's fine. Now, I'm not asking anybody to do this, okay? You want to be radical. Every person in my office made the exact same base wage. Now, you're, now let, let's, let's think about... So, to clarify that, you didn't, see every, you didn't say everybody made the exact same. Everybody made the exact same base wage. Yes. That, yes. The hygienists were paid on commission. But everybody else, not the office manager, but everybody else... The assistants in the front desk all made the same base. Okay, now I'm not suggesting you do this. It sounds like Russia here. I mean, you know, but okay. But I I had this happen when I was young, and I only had three employees. I had one that moved out of town, and I needed to hire somebody. McKinney's 30 miles from Dallas. A lady was moving to McKinney. She ran a practice of the this incredible doctor, Tom McDougal, and Caroline managed his office, and I was hiring her to work in my office and she was probably 15 years older than I was, you know, smart, good looking. She could probably prep teeth better than I could. I mean, you know, she was awesome. She walked on water. So I agreed to pay her $25 more a month than I paid anybody else. Okay. Now, how long do you think it took before everybody in the office, the other two people knew that I was paying her more about the moment it came out of my mouth, right? <laughs> even though we didn't discuss it. Okay. Now, and, and then everything got kind of nasty, okay? But in, a, in, a, in an average practice where you have three to five employees, could you work without your hygienist and have hygiene done? No. Could you work without having that one person at the front desk? No. So I don't see there was any, any greater value in one than the other. So I just went, it made me mad. I, I remember that Friday. I said, uh, Julie, actually it's Caroline. It's Caroline would you cancel all my appointments for Friday afternoon? And I'm going, and I was working six days a week. I never got sick in 40 years. I never missed a day of work. And they're going, what? And I said, yep. And I think you had some, some uh, uh, resumes. Uh, I want to see all the resumes. And, and I'll, I'll talk to you after you get this done. I said, okay, you, 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 you're all fired. You know, I decided right then that I was not going to hire people that made my life miserable. And I interviewed them again, and I hired two of them back, and I hired somebody else to replace the other one. And I said, from now on, you all make the same. Okay? Now, from that point forward, we introduced a bonus system or a profit sharing, and I can talk about that at a different hour and give you the details of it. Yeah. That, over a period of time, that bonus system replaced the cost of living, replaced the longevity base, uh, you know, pay. It became such a – I mean, it was – Two or three thousand dollars a month per employee, in addition yeah, to their pay, which was higher than they could have gotten anywhere else. So again, it created that staff-owned mentality, and and made a huge difference. Some point, I would love in okay, you know, we're talking about these things in the book, the super general dental practice that we've made available to everybody. There is a deal on the on the purpose-driven, doctor-led, staff-owned practice. Read the deal about staff ownership. And you start to see that perspective of, okay, what I do today is going to affect me in the future. What I allow, I encourage. And, and again, so when we talk about pay, I want to make sure basically that it's a competitive pay with competitive benefits, okay, for everybody. I don't want them to leave because of pay. But this is something that is a changing target for employees over the term of the employment that they serve with you, okay? So it changes. What was a viable pay scale now may not be a viable pay scale in the future. And so, again, that's where 
the, and I hate to call it a bonus system, it's really profit sharing. I shared the profit, okay? I gave them 15% of everything over a certain amount, and we had rules of how this was set up. And as I said, we could talk at that about yeah. a different time. And and that is actually in the book too. So, yeah, no, I mean, that's that, that chapter you mentioned in the book is phenomenal. I mean, that chapter about the purpose driven um, employee led, I mean, it's, it's phenomenal, but what it's in the like, order of, of the importance to purpose, leadership, staff owner too. So, yeah, let's do this. Let's leave this here on the compensation aspect and let's pick okay. up because, because we're kind of getting into the, the, I'm sure a lot of people are having these questions now. Is how, how, does, how is the base level the same for everybody? How does this bonus system work? And that's what we can, maybe we can pick up on the ne next episode exactly how you see that structured in a majority of, of practices and what that actually looks like and dive a little bit into those details. Um, we can go way deep. I want to do this. What's that? We can go way deep. Yeah. Well, I want to do this too. Let's, let's end. I think we'll start doing this on, on uh, this episode and future episodes is kind of one very tactical to do that that doctors can do that they're listening to this right now maybe it doesn't pertain specifically to this topic of compensation or whatever but just something you know you follow you're so deep in the dental industry every day during this pandemic i'm sure you're hearing something different like oh well really? we need to tell people to do this do you have one today you can leave our viewers with on on yeah you guys need to be doing this right now in your practice to kind of gear up for what's happening hey, i want to give you kind of a a little bit of a the CYA strategy. Sure. You know, cover your assets. Um, so again, it's, it's not, it, it's going to be difficult for a lot of these doctors to do this because um, it requires a little effort. It only takes about three or four minutes, but it still requires a little thought and effort to do this. And um, I can send, if you will remind me, I can send uh, a link two of these that our clients have done, okay? And it's a video. Uh, it can be done with an iPhone. You don't need a microphone. You need good lighting, okay? So, you know, make sure that, you know, it's, 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 it's good lighting. You could even do it at your office with the lights on. It'd probably be fine. But uh, it needs to be about how much, you know, you know, how concerned you are for your staff, for your, you know, for the, the patients and stuff. Uh, assuring them, uh, so show compassion and caring. Assurance portion of it, I, I, you know, that, you know, you're assuring them that, you know, everything will return to normal, that we were way ahead of the curve on, you know, even, I mean, like 20 times better than any medical office about PPEs and, and, you know, scrubbing the deals and, and covering and everything else. And in addition to that, we're adding these, this other level of, of deal, just something like that, that the first thing they see on your website yeah. is a video from you. And if you could get, you know, two or three of the, you know, if you had more than one doctor or you had some staff to, to stand behind you while you did this, uh, that's going to make a big, big difference. I mean, and I think a video, a video is key. I, I think those patients, they want to see you. You know, they, yes. they don't want to go. Yep. I mean, yeah, going to your website and seeing that written message at the top is great, but I think uh, that video, they can see you. They haven't seen you in a while. It gets that assurance. They see it on social media. They see it on your yep. website. It gives that yep. that trust factor that when and you're you, you, out, you could, like you said social media, yeah, you could push it on Facebook. Yeah. I, I would probably even push it on your practice management software to every email that you have. Yeah, an email blast. And then I would post it on YouTube. Now, you want to get some good, you want to raise your ranking for your website. I mean, Google owns YouTube. I mean, the minute you start pushing these videos. Now, if you get over that, like, oh, my gosh, kind of deal where, I mean, you might need uh, a, a very, because I have people like this in my practice, you know, when I was practicing, they very, they're real comfortable in front of a camera and they, they could talk. And if you're not, then you can partner with them to do this video where your part is not quite as, uh, you don't have to carry the whole show. Sure. Or you have an office manager that can help you do that. And, or it could be three of you doing it. And it, it's only last about, needs to be less than five minutes, but it, you know, just a quick deal. And, and so I can send you, 
And I'm not saying these are great. What I'm saying are they're great because they did them. Okay. And no one's, I, I don't want it to be so, I don't want you to go call somebody that you have to go in and sit in a studio. Yeah. Don't want it slick. I want it's it to be, be real. Movie from the heart to you, you, to your patients and telling them that, you know, we've always been ready for this. We'll be even more ready when the, when they, you know, when they let us get back at You'll be safe here. It'll be the safest place you could be. Safer than the grocery store. Safer than the pharmacy. Probably cleaner than safer than your home. Yeah. I mean, good. I mean, just, you know, really try to do it. And I have, I've had people tell me to do stuff like this before where they go, oh, Mike, would you endorse this book and do a video for me? I have nauseated doing it. I just, I, it, it just, I hated doing it. But you need to do this. You need to put on your girl panties and deal with this and get that there you go. there now. Okay. Yeah. No, it's 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 a must, and it's it's your your patients want to see it, and it's a I mean that's great advice. So, um, guys, I I mean I appreciate it. I mean we dove deep into I think a lot of the questions, or probably one of the biggest questions that dentists have right now is how to bring their people back. I mean we laid out several, you know, bringing them back just like it was, bringing them back as needed. You know, Dr. Abernathy, you said bring them back and maybe just pay them a percentage of your production. Um, bring them back, pay them the full, but maybe they're working limits. It's so many different options you can do. Um, and what we want to do on the next episode, dive a little bit deeper into that bonus system. What's that compensation system, you know, even, but then give them more on top that we can dive into. So guys, uh, appreciate your time. Let's jump on the next episode and uh, keep getting better. Thank you.